You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Now, in recent weeks on the Paracast, we've covered a variety of subjects. I know a lot of people think we emphasize UFOs a little bit too much. And I like to point out that we try to get to other subjects. And I'm going to hit one now that we haven't gone into for a really, really, really long time. And that's vampires. So, who's an expert on vampires? We got a notice here about a new book, actually a fiction book, but it's supposedly based on fact, about vampires called The Silently Series. And the author is Douglas Robinson, who is described as an expert on vampires and an educator. Now, Douglas, welcome to the PowerCast, but let me ask you the first question. An educator being a teacher? Well, uh, I was a teacher, but I really consider myself mainly a writer. So how did you get interested in the subject of vampires? Even from a very young age, I, I had them on my heart and my mind from a very young age. You know, my own past has a lot of um, uh, blood in it. A lot of blood Blood. in your path? How so? Well, like, for instance, when I was uh, about seven or eight, I started dreaming of myself dying. But to to make a long story short, I just really kind of know what I know about them because I've thought about them for so long, prayed for them for so long, and uh, uh, I'm aware of things, let's say, that way about them. In 1983, when I was taking a little fiction writing class at UAB, I started seeing, and sort of put that in quotes, seeing. That means it sort of plays like a movie in my head. And during that fiction writing class, you write two little short stories. You know, you learn the basics of writing, like this is a character, this is dialogue, this is a point of view. And the second short story of that class turned out to be the ending of the first novel-length story, Silently Comes the Night. And it's about the fight that Macon and John trying to save Thomas's life and all of this. You'll, you'll get into that as you read the first story. But over the next two months of that summer, I saw what happened before. I saw what happened after. And after the two months were over, I saw about the equivalent of 16 novel-length stories all regarding this girl, Macon, uh, who is a vampiric girl. And she's in love with Thomas, but Thomas doesn't know who or what she really is in the first story, but he finds out. And at the end of the first story, he's exposed to her blood, and uh, he's becoming vampiric himself in the second story. Okay, but when you say you saw this, did you dream about it? It plays like a movie in my head. But it's not, not dreaming, per se, but I, I do see it. You mean you're, like, channeling something that you believe to be information that comes from another source? Or can you elaborate on that some more to help, well, help us sort of get an idea what how you're... Are you visualizing, say, like a director for a movie, and then that becomes the script? Or do you, do you think it's something else, like actually some... I, I don't know that you would necessarily call it channeling, but uh, like I say, uh, I make clear that I am a Christian. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And, you know, I prayed to him regarding all of this. He gave me some scripture to help explain them, to help understand. One of them is in Joel. That's a book in the Old Testament, Joel 2, verse 2, and Joel 3, verse 14. It talks about a day of darkness, clouds, gloominess, and thick darkness. I talk about vampiric people as living people, not the basic Hollywood model of, you know, like undead vampirism or any of that. But I just basically see people stuck in a situation, and I think that I understand what I understand about them because I've prayed for them for so long, and I care what happens to them. And I think that's what opens up, you know, the fact that I care and care what happens to them. Is that what's opened up doors? How do you know they're vampires? 
then. They drink like, blood to live. Ah, uh, okay, I see. So that's not just Hollywood. Then that's something that uh, that you you believe is something that's really going on. Yes. Okay. And then, so what about uh, immortality? They do age slower than us. Uh, Macon herself was born in 1698, and she became vampiric. About She was at first exposed to vampiric blood at age 13, but her body changed over the next two years. At the time the story took place, she was 294 years old, and she looked like she was in her early to mid-20s. And today, she's... Uh, She'll be 320 on her birthday, the 15th of December, and she looks like she's in her late 20s. But this is a character in a fiction book, though, right? Yes, but I think okay. she's real. Oh, okay. Is there have how do you what makes you think she's real? Well, I've written other stories outside of this storyline, and I know the you know you create a character and so forth and so on, but. Maybe I just had this on my heart for so long. I just thought about it so long. It just became real on the inside of me before I started writing. Yes, but that you're, what you're saying here is but, that you believe that she is real and that these people are real. But that doesn't mean you actually met somebody. Or did you meet somebody who is what we would regard as a vampire, someone who consumes blood? Well, the only one I can talk about is the one I met at Walmart. It was like a, a afternoon, like two in the afternoon, and I saw him, and I knew what he was, but I didn't approach him because he was with friends and with other people. So, uh, but that day, I just sort of knew what he was. How did you know what he was? I just recognized. Uh, now there was nothing in his clothing. You know, he was dressed in what 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 you would consider normal clothing. You know, not not all black, for instance, but I just knew. Did you approach him at all and say, hey, are you a vampire or to try to find out exactly what was going on? No, I did not approach him. So you have just a, like an intuitive sense about it that you is that you rely on to to guide you in this. Um, uh I'm not sure what you would call it, an adventure, a quest, a purpose, or... Um, yes. So how did, how did you actually get involved in this then besides just, you know, thinking about them? Was there any sort of a trigger or when were you first even introduced to the whole idea of vampires? Well, uh, I started in Chicago because I was born in Chicago. But my family moved to Alabama when I was in junior high school age. And about that time, way back in the day, I saw the uh, gothic soap opera Dark Shadows for the first time. And, of course, was introduced to the vampire character in the story, Barnabas Collins. Now, I wasn't afraid. I just mostly was sad because of his condition. Um Vampiric people are lonely in the first place because they're cut off from society. And uh, just to make no no mistake about this, I'm talking about living people, not, not the Hollywood model. Uh, also, you should also know that there are many, many more human blood drinkers, that is, people on the human side that think it's cool or uh, just drink blood for any variety of reasons. But there are many more human blood drinkers than what I call true vampiric ones. You know what? Let's do our break now, because this is getting interesting, to put it mildly. We're exploring real-life vampires, not the guy with the Stanley Jackson. More to come. <laughs> You're in the Paracast. <laughs> We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails t-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast jumbo tote bag, all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have 
a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Let's talk tough. Let's talk comfort. Let's talk about down-home value. Made in the USA blue jeans, like you wore as a kid. Remember? There's a place down in Tennessee Where they make blue diamond gusset jeans They so pride in every stitch Guarantee you love the way they fit Put a diamond gusset in the crotch where you need it most. Blue diamond gussets got it. Others don't. For good old fashioned comfort, get diamond gusset jeans. Every stitch guaranteed. And our Defender motorcycle jean comes Kevlar reinforced. See them at GUSSET.com. That's gusset.com. Or call 888 848 7738. That's 888 848 7738. Diamond gusset jeans got it. Others don't. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow. A new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. Normal blood pressure, naturally. How would that make you feel? I'm Don from New Mexico. Uh, January of 2000, I had a heart attack. Uh, then my real health began going downhill. I had high blood pressure, diabetes, poor vision. I wasn't sleeping well. I was a mess. Don reports dramatic improvements with heart and body extract. I started taking heart and body extract from within a few days. I started sleeping better. My blood pressure normalized. My diabetes normalized. My sleep improved. Experience these benefits and more when your body heals itself with the assistance of heart and body extract order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 that's hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 and folks i did not expect this at all by the seventh eighth and ninth day i saw dramatic improvements from taking heart and body extract heart and body extract comes with a 100 percent ironclad money back guarantee details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for heart and body extract Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Okay, it's vampires on the Paracast. It's not even Halloween. Douglas Robinson joining us. We're not going to do the Bella Lugosi imitations. But it's kind of funny in retrospect that of all the people who play Dracula in the movies, the Bella Lugosi impersonation or role of Dracula in a 1931 movie and, of course, a Broadway play has become a cultural icon and poor Bella Lugosi died in poverty. Did you watch Dracula and all these other movies about vampires, or was it mostly Dark Shadows? The first show that I remember seeing was Dark Shadows, and of course, as I was growing up, you know, high school, college, I saw a few more. But since 1983, I've made a point of not really watching other shows or other media or other books. 
because I want to write my storyline with my ideas and not somebody else's. Well, that's a pretty good strategy because uh, it sort of allows all of the experiences that you've had and thoughts about it to percolate and and uh, become something more unique unto yourself. So tell us a bit more about your story then. Who's your main character again? Now, her name is Macon. Her name is spelled M-A-J-K-E-N. Her mother was Norwegian, and in her country, her her name would the K would be silent, and the J would be like an I sound, like Mikan. But here, uh, we pronounce it where the J is silent, and so it's Macon, the way I pronounce it. But uh, she is the lead character in the storyline, and like I say, the storyline begins in 1993 when she was in Trenton, New Jersey. And the young man involved with her was human at the time, Thomas. And Thomas didn't know anything about who or what she really was. But there were uh, an obsessed blood donor, a killer vampire in the city, and the young man's father that was later accidentally killed when he tried to kill her. Uh, All of these things came together, and the situation essentially disintegrated around her and then John took Thomas to use his bait to bait her. And so there's a battle at the end of the Silent Becomes the Night where she's trying to uh, stop John. And she doesn't know that Thomas isn't killed or not. She went out there, you know, expecting to find him dead, but he wasn't, but he was injured. And so it's a fight on the side of a cliff at the end of the story. Uh, The story itself uh, involves 16 stories altogether, 12 of them in what are what I call modern day. Now, modern day is not our modern day because there's a conspicuous absence of the Internet and cellular phones. The storyline that I'm calling modern day begins in 1993 and goes to about 1999. Four of the stories are historical. And they begin roughly in the mid-1650s and go forward to Macon's, uh, you know, some of her early years. So are are all the vampires in your novels, are they like all good or all evil? Or is uh, Macon an evil vampire or a good vampire? And, you know, why is um, she, has she become the target uh, for a death? Well, I think they're really more like the human population. Like the human population has some really, really, really good ones, some really, really, really bad ones, and then everybody else is a shade of gray in between. The reason I, I, I'm just sort of fascinated with making herself is because she has survived so long, and I think she has survived so long because I think many of her choices must have been the right ones. Now, she will kill if she has to, but I'm not aware that she's ever just gone out to to just do that. If she's pushed into the situation, she can and will kill. I like to understand, though, the conversion process. Now, obviously, in the modern... How you modern, get to be one? Right. In the modern legend, you bite them in the neck and they become a vampire or something like that if you don't kill them off. In this particular case, are they consuming blood from living beings, or is it like true blood where it comes in a bottle? Well, it's it's living from a living person in most cases. And, you know, making herself became vampiric because she was exposed to the person who made, who was a vampiric person attacking her. She was exposed to his blood. In the first story, Thomas is exposed to her blood. And the only person who didn't become vampiric that way is the vampiric girl in the second story, Janine. Janine was forced into a situation in a blood cult, and she had to drink blood, and her body started changing anyway. All right, well, let me just try to put this all in perspective then. So it's a mixture of blood, and I suppose that doesn't have to be done by biting somebody on the neck. It could just be blood to blood. 
you can just scratch somebody and you scratch your hand and then you put them together and they are now receiving some of your blood? I think it's probably more exposure than that, I would think. Uh, Thomas and Macon were cut up pretty bad in that fight because John had cut her with a machete. And he was bleeding after being dashed on some some sharp rocks. So it's, it's more than just like a cut. You know, more, more substantial than that. It sounds like a disease that infects someone. But I'm trying to look at reality because let's just go back to your experience. You saw someone at Walmart that you felt or believed to be a vampire. And yes. then the rest of this all sounds like something that you dreamed up. Am I wrong? That is correct. But but based on stuff that you sort of believe to be the case out there in the world where you haven't had a direct experience with it, but you sort you believe there's people out there who are vampires who are and then you believe there's this sort of second group. Uh, if I'm reading you correctly, that are just sort of like regular people. They're they're like um Say, you know, people like having who have an interest in Star Trek and dress up like Vulcans or learn to speak Klingon as a second language. And and they're not real vampires. They're just you know, kind of doing it for fun or for a cultural identity as opposed to what you consider to be a real vampire. Well, that is true. Um, but there's a little more to it than that. I think, you know, the devil sort of made all this happen anyway. And the way that I see it, I think there's an occultic glamour that they pray over this. Vampire anything is pretty much a big deal uh, to a lot of people, and the devil makes sure that it's as attractive as possible because he could lure more people into the occult with this. We have Douglas Robinson, and we're talking about vampires in reality. Not necessarily in fiction. With Gene and with Randall, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Cancer categorizes over 100 diseases. Though we do not diagnose, treat, or cure cancer, GCN team is offering the Clemson University study where there was up to a 95% reduction in cancerous cells when exposed to a plant-derived mineral supplement. If you or a loved one are searching for answers to this horrifying disease, come to GCNteam.com or call 877-878-4203. We'll email you a copy for free. That's 877-878-4203. Healthcare reform is confusing. With the loss of the Obamacare mandate, those needing help can now choose an affordable alternative. By joining Liberty HealthShare, you're part of a community of health-conscious Americans all over the country who control their own healthcare costs and choices. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of their medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. Remembering Senator John McCain, the Arizona Senator's office reports he passed away at age 81. Political friends and foes have been praising McCain's achievements and character since yesterday's announcement that he told doctors to stop his treatments for brain cancer. McCain was born to be a military man as the son and grandson of four-star admirals. I was raised in the concept and belief that duty, honor, country. His wife, Cindy McCain, tweets, My heart is broken. I am so lucky to have lived the adventure of loving this incredible man for 38 years. President Trump tweeted, My deepest sympathies and respect go out to the family of Senator John McCain. Our hearts and prayers are with you. You're listening to USA Radio News. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. Look at this little face. I do not love him. 
Hamilton the Pug, Instagram star, and Shelter Pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Now you can fly anywhere in the world and pay discount prices on your airline tickets. Book a flight today to London, Paris, Madrid, or anywhere else you want to go. And pay a lot less guaranteed. Call the International Travel Department right now at low-cost airlines. 800-215-5141. 800-215-5141. That's 800-215-5141. Policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas. Not available in all states. For details, visit AIGdirect.com. If you're young and healthy, you don't need life insurance, right? Yeah, that's what I used to think, too, until my brother died at 38. Joe left his wife with two kids, a mortgage, and a stack of bills she couldn't pay. Mary had to sell the house and move everybody into this tiny two-bedroom apartment just to make ends meet. I never want to do that to my wife, so I got life insurance. I called AIG Direct and was really surprised how affordable it is. Just $14 a month for $250,000 of term life coverage. Listen, if you have a family, you should seriously think about getting life insurance. You'll feel a lot better having it. Trust me. Call AIG Direct for a free no-obligation quote. The call takes less than five minutes, and you could save up to 70%. Call now, 1-800-910-7981. That's 1-800-910-7981. 1 1-800-910-7981. 1-800-910-7981. Hi, this is Bryce Abel. I'm the producer of Dark Skies, the co-author of AD After Disclosure, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So what's happening here is Randall is saying the Paracast without the requisite echo. I don't know how that went over. It may have been a lead balloon, but sure as heck went over. Now, as you say, you read very little in terms of vampire stories. You came up with your own, which is certainly an interesting interpretation of the vampire legend. And now you posit an entire society or civilization of vampires. If this exists, if this exists in reality and not just fiction, number one, how do we prove it? Number two, would the authorities know about it? Or are these vampires essentially outlaws who stay under the radar? Well, certainly they stay under the radar as much as they can. Some authorities may know about it, but it's very quiet. I can't really uh, speak to that because I can't say what the authorities know. But in, in larger terms, they are below your threshold. In 2002, I went to a, ret- a religious retreat for the weekend. It was called a walk to a mess. And for people who may have experienced this, you go away for a weekend at an international organization, and they just love on you for the weekend. And you sit with a table of other men or women, depending on which one it is, and you learn about the love of God and the grace of God all weekend long. Well, I had a vision my third night. And essentially, I'm walking along. It's a darkened landscape. It's all black. It's all burned. It's all dark. And the only light is available from the horizon where the sky is outlined in red, like it's on fire. I hear a distorted sound like a gurgling of water. But as I get closer to it, I see that there is a chasm cut in the earth. And it's very deep. There are people down there. And they're being pulled along by a river of blood. There was a young woman in the group of people pulled along by the river of blood, and she looked up. And when she looked up, I recognized her face. At that point, I looked for something to try to, you know, like a branch or something to lower down into there. But there was nothing to be found. The branch that I picked up uh, crumbled almost to dust. So I took a few steps back and then took a flying leap off into the chasm. And I woke up as I was on my way down into the chasm to um, go after them. And that was in 2002. 
So this is a sort of a, what you believe to be then because of your religious retreat, a sort of divinely inspired vision. And what do you think it meant then? Well, it was confirmation to me because I'd had questions and it helped me better understand where they are. If you think of something in the darkness, especially gross darkness like this, that's something a normal human can't see. Also, in Scripture, uh, flesh is generally referred to as earth or dirt. And since they are cut in a deep chasm in darkness below uh, ground level, they're beneath your sight. And like I say, a friend of mine who happens to be a pastor, he did make a comment that I did see them, even though it was really physically impossible for me to see them, I still saw them. So this must be a particular sort of kind of vampire then, because we have, say, if you go to the Book of Vampires, which uh, from 1914 to 26 type of thing, uh, it, it says there that vampires aren't necessarily bloodsuckers. Some inflict disease or suffocation or or they generally are quite nefarious and inflict either pain or death by some sort of nefarious means. But yours is very specific. It's it's of the blood sucking type and something that you perceive from your religious experiences to be evil. I don't qualify them as evil necessarily. Oh it's okay. The individual's choice. Well that's really interesting then. So so how is it the how do they become good or evil then, in your view? Uh, that's up to the person. Megan herself became a Christian in the storyline. Uh, she in the sacrifices short story. She was chained to a dungeon type area with an assembly of God preacher named Corey. And over the three days, they were waiting to be sacrificed. That is burned at the stake. And as Corey was talking with her. Uh, she, well, among other things, he taught her the little song, Jesus Loves Me, and it got into her heart, and she did accept Jesus as her Lord uh, just before they were to be burned at the stake. So would that mean, okay, we're talking Hollywood tropes here again, though. So perhaps, um, you know, is, is the crucifix then, does it, does it, would it not brand a vampire? No. Then? In the so, second story, Janine was a godly Christian Catholic girl, and when she became vampiric, she was she's probably still, even though she was vampiric, one of the most godly people uh, I've ever known. And yes, she wore a crucifix, and it didn't hurt her. That's really interesting. So how is it that we can sort of, um, how, how does a vampire do a good job of sucking someone's blood. I mean, I'm just trying to figure that one out. You know, like, so, uh, I, I mean, do they do they suck evil people's blood? And, or is it... There's, hi, there's hypodermics, there's razor blades, there's knives. I mean, you have to procure your blood source somewhere and get the person to bleed, although when they do bleed, they're mostly unconscious. People uh, sometimes want to know how much the blood they drink. If you remember the little half pint milk cartons, like when you were in school, a typical vampire vampiric meal is about three or four of those. They can drink animal blood for a short time, but they invariably go back to human blood because it's qualitatively different than animal blood. So, so, so now, if you can become a good vampire, uh, and in the favor of God, then at some point, um, do you believe that God, in all his uh, wisdom and power, uh, could simply cure them of their vampirism and restore them to normal people? I have to speak from what I've seen. Uh, I do believe when the scripture says with God, nothing is impossible. But Macon struggled with that after her experiences with Corey. And she is still vampiric, 
today. She still has to drink blood to survive today because of the physical change in her body. But yes, she is also still a Christian today, and that, that might be a dichotomy that I don't know that the church is ready to accept, but I have to help if the church wants it. Uh, I have to help them understand what these people are like and what their situation is. Uh, I think under most conditions, if they tried to, quote, get prayed for and healed, the prayer would fail. What, why, I'm would, saying, why would God? The reason I'm saying the prayer would fail is because the Scripture says faith worketh by love, and it's it's highly obvious to the, let's say, the average church member that they don't love us. And so the faith won't work. Okay, we're focusing here also on religious dogma, which I'd like to cover too and see how it relates to the question of vampires, real vampiric individuals. Ever fascinating. By the way, on the Paracast next week, our first episode for September will feature Calvin Parker, one of the two men who were involved in the Pascagoula, Mississippi abduction case. Fascinating. With Gene and Randall, you're in The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T.com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. Long distance travel or long hours in front of a computer can take its toll on your body. Get relief for your neck or back pain when you search Amazon for sunshine pillows, heating wraps, and pads, often listed as an Amazon choice. Why take another pill? Now, from Sunny Bay and by customer demand, we introduce our extra long neck heating wrap, a complete wrap, wide and hands-free, and brings fast relief to those who suffer from neck or back pain. You can easily find sunshine pillows on Amazon. Or search Amazon for our new Sunny Bay disposable heat pads. 
Or look for Sunny Bay heated neck wraps for relief from back pain to menstrual pain and cramps. Sometimes life can be a pain in the neck or back or shoulder. See why our company, Biomed DB Design, has a lifetime 100% positive rating on both Amazon and Etsy. Just go to Amazon.com and search Sunny Bay or call us 253-678-1361. Homemakers. Groceries by mail ships free. Try our amazing bacon. It stores in your pantry. No refrigeration required. Our value-added packaging provides a 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Always price less than grocery for your everyday use. Savory and delicious. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. This is Robert Hastings, author of UFOs and Nukes, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Good, you're not using the vampiric cliches. We don't need vampiric cliches. Douglas Robinson is here to set our minds straight about real vampires. And I have a question for you, Douglas. Why... Are people so fascinated with vampires? Well, I think the devil makes this his, uh, you know, anything to do with vampire anything is his number one draw because they're powerful, they're young, they're sexy, they look good, they've got plenty of money, they live forever, on and on and on and on and on. And if you were really vampiric, your life would be just miserable. Because what it boils down to, if you had to drink blood to live, is the only thing on your mind is, I have to drink blood today, I have to drink blood tomorrow, where am I going to get it? It's like an animal, almost. Well, I, I don't want to liken them to a, like a shark or to a bear, but yes, they are uh, feral. You are dealing with a physically changed, blood-drinking human predator. This is what they are. That can become in the favor of God somehow. How does that happen? Like, how do, how do you, how does they go from, like, you know, being one of the devil's favorite playthings to becoming in the favor of God? Well, every, everyone has a free will. You know, even the demoniac man uh, with the legion of demons in him wanted Jesus and could make that choice, and any person in their right mind can, in a physical body can make that choice. So what kind of choices do they make then, for example? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he said, because he said, I am the way, that's a choice every person has that opportunity to make that choice. So you're saying— him or not as Lord and Savior. So you're saying that, say, someone like, is this something that um, Megan did? Did she decide to make a conscious choice to follow Christ and therefore hope for some sort of redemption? Well, now, like any person that gets saved, the surety of your salvation comes over time, and it did for her just like it does for anyone else. She, her prayer literally was, Lord, save me, and he did. Now, what are some of the things she did besides pray? Like, did she do some, is she a heroine, or is she um, a villain? I think, well, of course, I have seen her for a lot longer. If she has to do something, I'm not really sure how to describe her, because Every person has bad in them. Every person has the potential for doing horrendous things, and I'm sure she does too. But I've never seen it in her behavior or her actions when she had a choice to be anything other than gentle when she can be. Of course, you're talking about a fictional character. She can be anything you want her to be. And... We're talking here about Christianity and its relationship. 
is there such a thing as a Jewish vampire? Is there, is there such a thing as a Buddhist vampire? Or possibly a Muslim vampire? I, I can't speak to the other religions. Uh, I'm only aware of Macon and Janine at this point. And you're aware of them strictly as fictional characters, not as real living people. True, until they walk up and say hello. Right, but does uh, Megan, what does she do, for example? What is some of the things she does in your story that would, um, say, give the reader a, a reason to cut her some slack and, and say, oh, well, okay, maybe she's not such a bad vampire after all? Well, especially in the second story, you see Janine, and, uh, you know, Janine is trying to save a seven year old girl from her own father. Her father is the leader of the blood cult, one of these wacky humans that thinks drinking blood is a good idea because it'll do something for you. And Janine is doing everything she can to save his daughter, his firstborn, because he decides he wants to sacrifice her. And as soon as Janine learns this, she says, no way. And so she takes Alicia and runs with her. Uh, the story, that part of the story took place in Helena, Montana. And by this time, Thomas is on the other end of the country in Sumter, South Carolina, going through his change. And Macon herself is sitting in New Orleans, recovering from what happened in Trenton. But when she, she decides to go to him and thinking that she can improve his chances for survival, she did love him, and she does love him in the storyline. And that's obvious in her behavior. That's obvious in when she met Thomas's sister, Kimberly. Now, Kimberly is a very naive. She was 16 years old at the time. She had already graduated from school because she was double promoted a year. But Kimberly is very godly herself and very naive and very brilliant which sort of goes into uh, maybe getting her in a little more trouble than she's ready to handle. But, you know, when Macon has a choice in all that I've seen in her, she doesn't, she's not out to just hurt and kill and cause damage. The thing that people need to understand about vampiric people in general is because they can't afford for, for wanton killing of humans, because the person that they kill today is the person they cannot feed from, say, three weeks from today. Uh, the human race equates to their food source, and so they know better than to go just r randomly, wantonly killing. Okay, that so makes a certain that's an encouragement. That makes a certain amount of sense. Now, you know, let's just hypothesize a little bit here and jump into the real world a bit. Uh, where we had a, a guest on recently talking about cattle mutilations, where some of these cows have been completely drained of blood in sort of a mysterious kind of way. Now, you, you know, do you think maybe you've got some kind of vampire action going on there or something? Uh, I think most of that is occultic because they make a point of leaving the cow and, and where it can be discovered. Or do they? Oh, yeah, they do, definitely. And, but, you know, and in these cases where the blood is all drained, it's really kind of odd. It's not something that you would typically see, according to the pathologists, of, in an animal that's just died on its own. So if you're saying that these are cults, uh, there hasn't been any actual hard evidence of that. It's sort of a mystery that happens. And in some cases, these animals are, you know, are believed to have been dropped from the air. Like, do your vampires fly, or do they, or do they have some kind of extra technology, or are they just like regular people? At this point, I see them as regular people, although they are stronger and faster than a normal person. And uh, so, but they could get by on cow blood if they needed to. Yes. Okay. So maybe what we've got is like you know the good vampires sort of out there you know taking cow blood or something instead of people and uh 
then the bad ones are the ones that actually go after it. So how come we don't have more evidence then of real people coming into hospitals with vampire bite marks or whatever the case is? Well, Macon takes blood uh, like venipuncture using needles and hypodermics and that sort of technology. Or she could use a knife or she can use, Janine used razor blades. But uh, I think a lot of this is hidden. What I'm calling true vampiric people, I think a lot of that is hidden in what the human population does. So you you got to sort of sift through it all to, to really see it. Now, there are some things there that obviously challenge medical science. It would be nice maybe to have them look at a vampire and see what there is about this subculture that allows them to live for hundreds of years and age very little, like a Kryptonian or something like that. Well, and now let's talk about that in our next segment, okay? All right? Yes, sir. Right. We're talking about vampires and the work of someone who has explored this society, for better or worse. And I won't even begin to try to make a suggestion one way or the other, but certainly something that has gone on. We have our co-host, J. Randall Murphy. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. Uh, uh, uh. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Individuals and businesses with tax problems, listen carefully. Do you feel like you're losing control over your finances? If you owe over $10,000 in back taxes or have unfiled tax returns, we can help you take back control. The IRS is the largest and most aggressive collection agency in the world, and they can seize your bank account, garnish your paycheck, close your business, and file criminal charges. Take control of your tax problems now by calling the experts at Tax Mediation Services and take advantage of the Fresh Start program and new laws that may allow us to negotiate a settlement for the lowest amount possible. Our team of tax attorneys and enrolled agents can stop collections and get you protected so you can take control of your financial future. Tax Mediation Services is accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Call now for a free case review and a price protection guaranteed quote. Call Tax Mediation Services now at 800-301-5435. That's 800-301-5435. 800-301-5435. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Oh, yeah. I see that Randall, I don't think he's had a chance to drink the true blood, but something going on there. Douglas Robinson joins us. He has written a book or a series of books called The Silently Series about this subculture involving real vampires. And he believes they're real. It's not just something in a book that he wants to sell a book. It is something that he believes to represent the truth and nothing but the truth. So I want to ask you again here. When drinking blood from someone already infected with whatever this is, a virus or whatever, 
when they drink enough of it or whatever, or consume enough of it or have it mixed with their blood, their lifespan increases from, you know, 70, 80, 90 years to hundreds of years, and then some. Are we dealing here with a physical phenomenon that, like a doctor, could look at their blood and say, hey, this is why they, they age slowly. What about their DNA? Or is it something more paranormal? Now, the scripture that I was given in Joel 2, verse 2, gives the four aspects. Making herself was changed on the darkness pathway, which means something to do with the occult. Gloominess is iniquity in the family line. That is, you have a compulsion, like some people have a compulsion to drink or smoke. Well, there's also a compulsion in the family line to drink blood. Macon's friend from New Orleans, Stephan, changed this way. There's clouds, which is what I call a partial conversion. Stephan's intended Michelle in the third story falls under this because she had not fully changed yet because they were taking their time to get her there. And then there's a thick darkness. You don't meet one of these kinds until the middle of the storyline where Macon meets a person such that she has never seen before, and he's so different from anything, he's called the other. So out of these four aspects, all the way from clouds to gloominess to darkness to thick darkness, there's the difference in in the manifestation. Like in Macon's case, it's like 25 years, calendar years for one of her physical years. In Stefan's case, it's more like 15 years for, you know, 15 calendar years for one of his years. In the lowest case, it's more like, you know, like five years for one year, two, two to five years for one, for one physical year. So all the way up the scale. The reason they don't appear to age, in the third story, Macon was actually in an accident and she was kidnapped by these doctors in Odessa, Texas. The third story of the storyline is called With Deadly Intent. As part of this storyline, Macon herself has been captured by these doctors. Specifically, her internist, Dr. Benjamin, is trying to figure out what, what she is because they know that she needs blood, but they're trying to get an understanding of this. Even after they zapped her with an X-ray and other things, he did determine that more of her metabolic process was given to maintenance and repair. In his case, he found like 75%, but I think making in her native, normal, natural state, that percentage is much higher, like around 95%. Blood is a very singular food source. Humans have to eat and drink all kinds of things, you know, like steak, like salads, like vegetables. But a vampiric person that has to survive on blood, it's a very singular food source. So their metabolic process is streamlined. And so much more of their physical metabolism is given to maintenance and repair than a normal person, which is why they don't appear to, quote, age as the years go by. Well, let me ask you another question about the vampire. The other legends, which is, during daylight, they have to return to their native soil. That's the Dracula legend. And then if they are not going back to coffins, they still have to stay indoors during the day. And only at night can they emerge among us. Otherwise, they will burn up in the sunlight. Is this anything that's true? Or can they just live among us and behave completely normally? Well, Macon has sunlight sensitivity. But it, she won't burn into flames. She'll get sick. Uh, if the devil had all of vampiric people burst into flames when they get into sunlight, all of his uh, work, it goes up in flames, literally. But if you can make them sick in the sunlight, you can still get them to operate mostly at night. Uh, but without the risk of uh, losing your investment. So this is very much involved with God and the devil in what they worship and what they do. But we're looking at the Christian 
religion. We're not looking at other religions and how that might impact the vampire's journey. Well, like I say, since, since I am a Christian, I do believe that uh, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. I believe that's true. In uh, real life, they've there is such a thing as clinical vampirism. It's it's known as Reinfeld syndrome, and that is a compulsion to drink blood. However, uh, the medical literature on that doesn't indicate in any way that it actually contributes to longevity. So it seems to me that the whole longevity thing is purely much mythological. Although there are people that do drink blood. Like I say, I I know what I saw. And, um, you know, uh, I'm relating to you as I've seen it and I understand it. Most of what I know about vampiric people comes from making herself as I've seen and looked at her. Well, this, again, sounds very much more like a channeling of a, somebody that you believe is a real character somewhere rather than uh, a character that you've developed for a fictional novel. Mm, uh, I, would, I don't know that I would use the word channeling, but there is an awareness there, yes. Yeah, I, it's, um, so how, it, it, it's like a, are we talking like a tel- form of telepathy then? I think what largely happened when I was around 13 or so, I prayed unto the Lord for them. And at that point, I had got where I saw that they were abandoned and feared and nobody wanted them. But I did. For whatever reason, in my, in my mind at that time, I, I told the Lord, I prayed, Lord, let me have them. And I think that I know what I know about them because he said yes. So when you say you pray now, uh, people pray in different ways. Were you praying uh, in your mind as a thought that you could hear, or were you praying out loud so that, say, it could be picked up on a microphone? When I, when I talk to the Lord, I talk to him like I'm talking to you. It's a verbal conversation, but it's also out of my spirit. Right, but say, would another person standing next to you be able to hear you? Yes. Oh, okay. So then uh, sort of the assumption there would be then that um, uh, if it were Christ you were praying to, that he could actually hear the sound waves uh, and interpret them that way? Or do you think that he's picking up on your actual mental thought, like some sort of telepathic thing that goes beyond mere auditory uh, transmission of sound for communication purposes? Now, you know, how the Lord knows and can hear everything, when he was going to the cross, he prayed to his Father, Restore unto me the glory that was mine before the beginning of the earth. Let me break here, guys, and we'll have more. Douglas Robinson, Gene Steinberg, J. Randall Murphy, you're in the Pattercast. Neighbors, we've made such a deal with HelloFresh, and it means that everyone listening to this show can receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PARACAST30. You know, with HelloFresh, you can choose the delivery day that works best for you. They've got a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. And can you imagine me cooking Japanese panko chicken? It makes me feel like I'm a chef. It means also that you could actually... Get your meal cooked in 30 minutes. For busy people, this is perfect. The simple recipes include step-by-step instructions so even I can figure it out. Go to HelloFresh.com. Use the offer code PARACAST30 to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. HelloFresh.com. Let's talk tough. 
Let's talk comfort. Let's talk about down-home value. Made in the USA blue jeans like you wore as a kid. Remember? There's a place down in Tennessee where they make blue diamond gusset jeans. They so pride in every stitch. Guarantee you love the way they fit. They put a diamond gusset in the crotch where you need it most. Blue diamond gussets got it. Others don't. For good old fashioned comfort, get diamond gusset jeans. Every stitch guaranteed. In our Defender motorcycle jean comes Kevlar reinforced. See them at GUSSET.com. That's gusset.com. Or call 888 848 7738. That's 888 848 7738. Diamond gusset jeans got it. Others don't. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. I started fighting the IRS over 40 years ago when they tried to seize my mother's house. I sued the IRS and won. I beat the IRS then, and I've been beating them ever since. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I've helped thousands of people deal with tax problems they thought might never be solved. I can help you too. If you owe taxes you can't pay, don't wait another day. There's no such thing as a hopeless tax case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com, danpilla.com. It's been said, any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. 99 bucks for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. You would not survive, uh, Bela Lugosi. Douglas Robinson, you were quoting something from Scripture there, and I probably interrupted you. Would you continue, please? When Jesus was on the cross, you know, he was a man, but he was also God. But he prayed to his Father, restoring to me the glory that was mine before the foundation of the world. And then originally he was called the Word. You know, you had the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And when he took flesh, his name is Jesus, but he never put down his flesh. But he took up his divinity again when he rose from the dead. So since God knows everything, Jesus knows everything, and uh, he's now as much God as he was before he came to the earth, but he's also still a man, the way I see it. So I don't know that you would call it telepathy when he can know our thoughts. I think it's because he's God that he knows our thoughts. When I pray to him, either in my heart or verbally, he still hears it. Right. Well, that would kind of uh, fit the definition of telepathy when you consider it as a form of communication. You know, just like if you believe that uh, God created human beings, then by virtue of the fact that we have genetics and DNA, God must have been a genetic engineer because he created us out of that process through exactly those processes. Interesting thought. So, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to make sort of some 
sense out of it so that we can maybe demystify it a bit, take a little bit of maybe some of the magic and the mysticism out of it and say, okay, well, if there's a being out there that's able to read your thoughts and then talk back to you through your thoughts in the form of visions so that you believe that what you're actually experiencing is a form of divine communication and then you're you're putting that down in words that form your novel and yes yeah so that's really quite interesting actually it's it's i'm not sure i've ever heard of that way of actually coming up with a particular uh plot line but yeah, people's creativity works in many ways. Well, the interesting part about my experience is, even though I'd had vampiric people on my heart for so many years, I think that's what prepared my mind. Because when I saw all of this, it was just two months. Now, in any of the stories, when you open up the front of the story, uh, there's a list of the 16 uh, stories yet to be uh Two of them are written, 14 of them are not yet written, uh, three of them are in, are in process now. But you will see the entire storyline as, as I saw it with the titles of the stories and how they are. So in your mind then, what is it, or in your communication or in your visions, what makes you believe that, uh, say, that it's actually objectively true as opposed to, say, uh, Christ helping to provide you with inspiration to write your story, which is purely fictional, but still assisting you nevertheless. Each of the four story blocks, that is, you know, every four stories. When I was sitting and thinking about all of this, it looked like to me that each four story blocks repeated the pattern of love grace, compassion, and what I call right with God. And that seemed to me to be too much of a coincidence for me to have come up with it, say, on my own. In the first story, Silently Comes the Night, Macon does fall in love with Thomas. It's rather late in the story before you really see a manifestation of that. But her, her behavior toward him and her concern for his life and all of these things makes me think that, that that her love for him was real. In the second story, you meet Janine, which introduces you to the grace of God, because even though Janine is vampiric and she's being chased by this madman that wants to kill his own daughter, the grace of God keeps showing up. I didn't even find out until later that Janine's name itself means God is gracious. In the third story, Macon is captured by these doctors and her internist, Dr. Benjamin. He's a good man, but he's being pressured by these other doctors around him. But he eventually comes to the conclusion that what Macon is is a closed system, that nothing can be done, nothing can be gained from her to help, say, prolong human life or cure diseases. When he saw that, he released the seals on this, this tank thing they had her sealed in, and so compassion shows up. In the fourth story, Kimberly is involved, and Kimberly is a very naive but, but godly girl. So I'm very certain in the fourth story that right with God is going to show up. And that pattern persists throughout each of the four-story blocks. That's one of the other reasons why I think this story is more real. All right, but right now all we have here is your feeling that, number one, you met someone who might be a vampire at a supermarket. You had dreams. You imagine an entire subculture of living creatures that subsist on blood and live for centuries rather than decades. And it sounds fascinating. You also inserted your Christian beliefs into your stories, which is your privilege, of course, and the way you do things, and nobody's going to criticize that. I'm just trying to find a reality in it. To me, it just sounds like, well, well this is cool, this is an interesting slant on vampires, but what else? I could be wrong. 
This could be all my imagination. Uh, maybe I'm screwed in the head, whatever you want to call it. I could be wrong. Well, what I'm seeing here or hearing here actually is a lot of symbolism. And you seem very aware of the symbolism, uh, particularly religious symbolism, and how it relates to different forms of morality, psychology, and so on in a religious context. And you're weaving it together in a story that appears, from my perspective, to help to bring an awareness to the reader about the good and evil from the perspective that you're seeing it. So maybe you might want to consider that, you know, it's not necessarily just fiction in terms of of that particular context. We can, we can, in other words, we can, all forms of storytelling can convey a message and your message can be in, entirely sincere and real and um, valid within a, a religious philosophical theological framework without it necessarily having to anything to do with say real vampires maybe it's your calling so to speak to write this story to inspire people to think more about these symbolisms that you're describing because really they if if we look at it on that level they are quite fascinating uh you're very kind thank you for that we've got more to come okay. with gene and Douglas and Randall, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T.com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. He was a warrior who became a politician and for many, an American hero. Arizona Republican Senator John McCain has died at age 81. He'd recently stopped treatment for brain cancer. He once said he has no regrets and held no grudges. If I took offense at everybody who has said something about me or disparaged me or something like that, life is too short. You've got to move on. At a reception honoring McCain earlier this year, Democrat Chuck Schumer paid tribute. These are the things I think of when I think of John McCain. I think of his steadfastness which could also be called stubbornness, his biting sense of humor, which could also be called cantankerousness. And I think of his principle, his unyielding faith in America's values, which cannot be called any other thing. You're listening to USA Radio News. This is an urgent health notice for all residents suffering from back, neck, knee, and wrist pain. You may qualify for a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you, but the deadline is fast approaching. Simply call the Health Alert Hotline now. You heard right. You may qualify for a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace. These items may even be covered by Medicare or your private insurance. The Health Alert Hotline is your brace company. These specialized braces have been tested for pain relief. Call us toll-free right now to determine 
determine your eligibility and to learn how to use your private insurance or Medicare to minimize your out-of-pocket cost. Don't wait. If the deadline passes, you may lose your opportunity to get a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace at little or no cost to you. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. That's 800-296-1261. Hey everyone, Proactive MD has an incredible offer for our radio listeners only. Stay tuned for our exclusive offer that includes a free charcoal pore cleansing brush and free shipping. Proactive MD with prescription strength adapalene can heal and prevent future breakouts. Today, for just $19.95, we're offering listeners the three-piece Proactive MD system with free shipping, plus a free gift, the new charcoal pore cleansing brush. Get this exclusive offer by calling now, 1-800-583-8662, or go to Proactive.com and enter promo code radio. You heard right. Proactive MD plus free shipping and a free gift. The new charcoal pore cleansing brush. You'll get all this for just $19.95 and their 60 day money back guarantee. You're guaranteed to get clear and stay clear or you get your money back. Call now 1-800-583-8662. That's 1-800-583-8662 or go to proactive.com and enter promo code radio. Again, go to proactive.com and enter promo code radio. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So Randall's playing it straight. Douglas, let's continue because certainly Randall is providing a very good interpretation of the meaning of of your book and trying to find more in the stories and just somebody writing a fiction story. Let's go on with that. Certainly. Are you hoping that maybe you might get some interest from people into making this into uh, a media, like, you know, film, TV, uh, maybe even a theater production of some type? I've uh, had a number of people say that when they read it, they can see it visually. And so I think the story plays out well visually, and some people uh, have said that they thought, they thought it would make a good movie. Now, I don't have the resources or anything to approach people for that, but uh, some people have suggested that, yes. And uh, so now what state are your books in now? Are, can they be got on Amazon, for example? Yes, the first two books, the first one is Silently Comes the Night, the second one is called Rites of Passage. If you search for my name, Douglas Robinson, there is also another Douglas Robinson who writes. But if you also insert the phrase silently, series, storyline, you can find my stories on Amazon or Kindle. Okay, so maybe you know what all you need is just to uh, kind of reach that critical mass where you get enough people who are interested in your stories and then you know maybe if you're lucky you will get approached maybe you know if this calling that you're you're set yourself on is really meant to play out that way it's going to change some people's lives in some hopefully positive way but do you ever worry yourself that you might get drawn into the whole vampire type of thing do you do you have to put up sort of a some kind of a, in your mind, psychic barriers or safeguards to keep you from getting kind of sucked into the whole vampire thing yourself? Well, you know, since I have lived a life with a lot of darkness and a lot of blood, and sadly, I've seen a lot of blood. So I don't think that I'm really quite normal as it is anyway. Uh, The Holy Ghost said he would protect my life, and I believe him. And he's guiding me. And in fact, as I was writing rights, he uh, inserted a number of scenes in the story as I was writing it. So he helped me write it. And I thought that was rather amazing if people knew that. Uh, Without uh, the... Now, when I say Holy Ghost, for people who may not know, the third person of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit. And some people call him Holy Spirit. Some people call him Holy Ghost. I do. 
But he's my partner and my friend in all of this because if I didn't think the Lord was leading me, uh, I wouldn't have even started it. Well, that's really interesting. You have to forgive me a bit here because I'm trying to translate this through the way that I think, which is uh, at, at one point many years ago, I was a believer in God and so on. I went to Sunday school as a child. And I, from my perspective, over the years, evolved a, a different perspective on religion. And because of that process, I believe that people who are religious and have the kind of experiences that you describe are on their own special path. And it, there may come a time that you evolve a different perspective yourself, but that in the meantime, this is your own special journey. And you have to see it through. So, you know, I'm wishing you every success in that. Well, thank you. At the same time, I'm trying to sort of, uh, you know, like I say, translate it to to something that um, is more objective in the world. Uh, we're, we're talking about, say, beliefs in certain entities uh, for certain reasons that come about. And these are these are quite mysterious in and of themselves. Like if the vampires are mysterious, I think that this inspiration that you're getting, this sort of divine inspiration, is itself quite mysterious. And I don't have the same view of God as you do, I don't think. But what do you actually see God as? How do you define this? Like, do you believe he's a creator? Are you a creationist? Well, uh, in the beginning of the scripture that I have, which is the King James Bible, it says, in the beginning, God. And it just sort of leaves it there because the scripture itself says that those who come to God must believe that he is. And his one of his names, as he was described in the Old Testament, is that I am. So seeing that I take the scriptural interpretation of God literally, and like that, and that I believe that Jesus is necessary for a person's salvation, and that's how I view the world, then, you know, I, I can't really speak to the other points of view because I haven't really experienced them. But I, I, I'm thinking that with God's help and me writing this storyline, I do think it is what I am supposed to do. And, and do you see an end point for this? Do you see... Um... You know what I'm saying? A, a, a overall purpose to this that, you know, what are your readers supposed to come away with by the time they're finished reading this series? If you think of a vampiric person as being literally stuck in that situation, I think your capacity, I think people's in general capacity, uh, they would care a little bit more and not be as afraid. I think the purpose my storyline presents is a uh, open window. Now, Macon herself describes what she is as looking through a dark window. That's a, like an analogy in the first story, and it pretty much is because they're on one side of the the track, so if you will, and we're on the other side. My point of view that I think I have when I'm writing, I think I'm on their side of the tracks looking back across at humanity uh, rather than me sitting where I am now trying to understand their world. This is a morality tale, obviously. And I wanted to ask you here, you have written these books for how long? When did the first volume come out? Uh, I started writing in 1983. Uh, silently, the first draft took me three years. I submitted it to a contest and got editorial help. The second draft took me three years. And then, for some reason, I just couldn't seem to go any farther. So I went off and wrote other things. But I came back to the storyline in 2010. And I finished uh, silently in a couple of months. And then I picked up Rites of Passage and wrote it in a year. Since you had these books published, has anyone come to you with more inflammation, more information illuminating 
the Vampire Society? Uh, no. What kind of reaction do you generally get from your readers? Uh, honestly, I haven't really uh, encountered my readers directly. Some people I've gotten feedback say that they're really liking the storyline. Uh, I've seen a few comments online, which are generally positive, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but, you know, by and large, I'm, I'm not really in regular contact with my readers because I'm not on social media and I'm not on any of these other platforms. Right. You're, I'm pretty sure I've got your name spelled right here. I'm looking on Amazon now, and I'm not seeing any of your books coming up here. Well, I hope we'll find it before long. You know, let's have that question answered in our next segment. The series is silently, and we'll be silent for a few moments for some pieces of business. We've got Douglas, Gene, and Randall, you're in. The Paracast. listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Would it be okay if you had two paychecks instead of one? I'm Pharmacist Keith. Dr. Wallach, the Dead Doctors Don't Lie guy and myself, want to show you how to get an extra paycheck every month, creating an extra income that will last for years to come by joining Dr. Wallach's crusade, spreading his message of better health. To learn more, visit radio.recordedvideo.com. That's radio.recordedvideo.com, radio.recordedvideo.com, or call 866-257-3105 for a recorded message. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T.com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. Bacon lovers, we ship free. Try our amazing bacon. No refrigeration required. Proprietary value-added packaging provides 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Savory and delicious. Wholesale price for your everyday use. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation. Analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. 
Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. Hi, it's Grant Cameron from PresidentialUFO.com. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Okay, Randall, did you succeed in locating the books on Amazon? Well, I'm uh, looking under Douglas Robinson. I'm not seeing anything come up in the way of vampires. There's a, I think we've got one, a translating thing, but... Probably, let's see, where are we here? Oh, wait a minute. Ah, here we go. Yep. I think uh, you were saying one of them was rites of passage? Yes, sir. So, yeah, there we go. Here we go. They're just a little further down the page. That's all. And uh, it looks like uh, one of them's got a four and a half star rating. Well, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so there we go. Pulled that one out of the fire. Had me worried for a second there, Doug. When you write, then, how does this take place? Do you have a computer or a workstation, or how do you do it? Well, back in the day, the original story was typed, you know, handwritten in a notebook or paper, and then typed on a typewriter back in the day. Uh, lately, I use a word processor in a computer. Do you, so do you have sort of your morning ritual, like, uh, or do you just sort of, when the vision strikes you, you just run to the word processor and, and dig right in? Or are you on a day job where you've kind of got to remember? How does this work? I, I'm on a day job. I have to work my day job to survive at this point. Right. So so now you're hit with this uh, vision or this inspiration to write something down. How does that work? When it hits you, do you, can it happen at any time while you're at work, while you're away, while you're driving your car? or And then what happens? Do you carry a voice recorder around with you and say, you know, start taking notes or describe some of your creative process with that? Well, the, the process that I use for, for writing, uh, for one thing, it's been kind of hard on me since I finished with rights. I'm kind of um, battling through some things. But I have a what I call a scene list. That is, before I wrote silently, I had a list of words on a piece of paper, you know, about 70 words. And each of those words represented a scene that I was going to write in the story. So generally speaking, I, I make a scene list so it's clear in my head from beginning to end where I think it could go. Now, that's not saying that it will necessarily go that way, but... I have an overall idea before I start out, and then I look at the, uh, you know, I know the characters well enough. I know the scene. I know the the setting, the description of the area. By the time I get ready to write, all of this is sort of full in my head. So when I pick up and write chapter one, I'm ready to go, and I try to get through the first draft quickly. And then after that, it's just a matter of polishing and uh, editing and making sure it's, you know, correct, grammar-wise. That all uh, sounds because... like your sort of typical process, That's that's and a good way to go about it, too. But I'm kind of more interested in this sort of divine inspiration when you're, when you're hit with this vision to, you know, it needs to be this certain way. When does that occur? While you're writing or... It, is it just at a random time during the day? How, When do they happen? Well, like I say, I've had further inspiration since I started picking up the storyline again. But pretty much I'm trying to stay uh, true to what I saw the first time uh, back in 1983. You mentioned before that you have a day job. What is it? Yeah, I'm a programmer. For consumer products or for business products? Uh, 
I work at a manufacturing plant. Uh, I maintain their inventory program. I help them with reports. Uh, I am an access programmer. I can do almost anything you can do with data with access. So you're pretty good with visual then? Visual Basic, C++? Uh, visual Basic 6, which is very uh, old school. Right. Okay. So you do this in the evening. You have a family? Uh, I, at this point, I do not have a family, but I'm hopeful. Okay. We all hope for a good family association. I was thinking here whether your family members have commented on your books, on your exploits in writing these titles. Uh, my father died in 1983. My mother died in 2004. Um, I have no brothers and sisters. Sounds like a lonely existence. Well, in, in some ways I can relate to how lonely they feel. Uh, but like I say, I trust in the Lord and I'm hopeful for my future. Well, if you don't mind us digging a little bit, you've mentioned a couple of times that you've had a lot of blood in your past. And what I'm can you elaborate on that a bit and, and describe what you mean by that? Well, one instance I clearly remember is uh I remember walking into my bedroom and I can see blood dripping from the floor to the ceiling uh visually. And I sort of closed my eyes and prayed. And I said, we don't do this anymore. Then I opened my eyes again, and it was a normal bedroom. I think it was just dark impressions on my very young mind made an impression on me. The other reason that I think that I'm not like a normal person is that when you see a person drink blood, invariably a human would have some sort of reaction to that. Yeah, it negative may not usually. Be that same day. Well, it, it, I'm told it's a very substantial reaction, but I don't know what that is because I never had it. You, so you don't think, mm, you know, I can, you can hardly wait to get your, you know, straw. I'm in, sure it's, in the... I'm sure it's tasty, but what I'm talking about is when, when you're literally seeing someone drink blood, a human has a reaction. That's so I'm told. Well, but I mean, how many people have actually seen that in real life? I mean, we're all talking about theater for the most part. Uh, I mean, there are certain groups of people that do this. We know about them. They're small, sort of cult-like uh, culture, subculture, like a vampire subculture where they do this. But, uh, you know, I don't think there's very many people that do it. Uh that, you know, I, I think there are, but like I say, that's just my opinion. One thing that kind of bothers me about all this is not that you wrote what sounds like a real fascinating story. I like to read some of these novels. We hadn't had a chance from booking the show. We wanted to have you flesh it out. Is that if there was anything like this in the real world, someone somewhere would reach out to you and say, Douglas, I'm a vampire. Let's talk. It surprises me that having had these books in circulation for a while, this has yet to happen, or maybe you're reaching the wrong people. Uh, like I say, uh, I'm not afraid of them. And so if they do want to come up and say hi, I'm okay with that. Have you done uh, you know, book readings that say, uh, what are your bookstores down there, Barnes & Nobles or... And I'm not sure we have up here something called an indigo, for example, where uh, authors that write books, they'll set up a table and sometimes they'll have actual readings take place and sign books. Have you ever done a book signing? Uh, no, I, I didn't think that I had enough friends uh, for that. I jokingly say all three people that would show up. I've already given them a book anyway. <laughs> well, it might be something you want to try if, because some of these evenings, uh, people have they have their own little table, and you know, maybe nobody will stop by and but and pick up pick up a book, or maybe several people will. But either way, you just kind of hang out, and there's other people you can meet. And uh, chances are, with the popularity of the genre, 
you would probably attract some people to talk to you about your work. This also okay. reminds me of a situation here where my son and I wrote a science fiction novel. And the first novel was published by our agent. And we had this bunch of books to distribute. We actually personally distributed those books to Barnes & Noble in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we scheduled a book signing. And it wasn't like hundreds of people. Maybe it was dozens of people. But they came over. They met us. They apparently enjoyed the book. We talked to a lot of people. We had a fun time. And I'm thinking here, if you went with your book to one or more of your local stores where you live and talked to the store owners or management, you could probably arrange something here and maybe meet some people and see what's going on. Maybe even think about getting on those social networks, even though you may not like it. We've got Douglas Jean and Randall. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items. And entails t-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast jumbo tote bag, all sorts of t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. You go to store.theparacast.com, stop by, and take a shopping tour. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So Randall Murphy is lost in his echo chamber. Sounds like a bubble. You're in your bubble. Douglas, let's continue here. So maybe I'm giving you an idea here. What are you doing now to promote your book? Obviously, we got a press release, which is why we decided to contact you. Beyond that, are you going on a number of radio and TV stations to talk about this? Through Nicole, I'm able to get on radio stations. Uh, I decided not to enter the social media realm because that is tracked far too much. And since the people that I uh, look to are hunted anyway, uh, I decided that social media is not the way to go. Now, I have been in bookstores. Uh, I uh, work with writers groups, and I meet with different writers, but my stories themselves are not priced at the point where I can afford for a brick-and-mortar bookstore like Barnes & Noble or Books a Million to take, you know, 50% of the cover price is their take on it. I don't 
uh, I can't produce the books for the amount that would be like a mass market paperback. Uh, they're produced as trade paperback and library editions on Amazon, and that was the best that I could do for distribution. Uh, and they're priced accordingly because they're uh, printed on demand. I want to be the one to talk to you about this, but I just discovered something. You have this website, silently-publishing.company. Yes. Etc. And when you go to the site, this is your site, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So if I click on the link to Silently Comes the Night on your homepage, it goes to a 404 error, meaning that it's pointing to an incorrect page, incorrect URL. And I think more than anything else, you ought to fix that. Yes, I'll, I'll call the company that hosts it, see what I could do. Okay. So if you need any you assistance, let me know. Randall and I do muck around on the Internet every so often. All right, so get, getting back to this, I understand your concerns about online privacy and why you don't want to get involved. But the way to get the word out about new books, new ideas, is to get traffic on Twitter and Facebook. If you're careful, real careful, you can do it in a way that doesn't seriously compromise your privacy. Why should it matter? Because what you've got are, according to you, you've got some divinely inspired books here that, uh, you know, to not promote them would seem to be something that would go against that inspiration, right? Uh, obviously, you would think the purpose here is to get them out and get as many people reading them as possible because there's a message there that you were divinely inspired by from Christ or God or your faith, whatever it happens to be. Why on earth would you want to not want them tracked? I mean, you, sh hypothetically, you would want everything to be as out in the open as possible. No, certainly that's true. But, uh, you know, I've gone to various churches and attempted to uh, speak to the senior pastor of the church and try to explain what this project does. And in many cases, or in most cases, they really just don't, they either show no interest at all, or they politely ask me to leave. Right. But I mean, you need, don't need to be going to a church for, you need to be going to Twitter and Facebook and MySpace. I mean, at least you're on Amazon and that's good. Let, let me ask you this. If you type in, say on Amazon, you just type in vampires, what you get is over 80,000 results. That's a lot of competition. What sets your books apart from the, your competition? The only thing that I could say about my revelation of these people is that I see them as real people and I see them as suffering. I don't think it follows the typical um, Hollywood model. And like I say, when I saw my storyline, it wasn't from uh, me trying to, quote, make up a vampire story. I just saw what I saw because it had been on my heart for so long. You felt your uh, vampire story. Yes, I did. Right, but you must be familiar with the number of the other stories out there. So, you know, why should people buy yours instead of, uh, you know, one of these other bestsellers that are, you know, at the top of the list? If I'm right about anything I saw, the world will eventually find out that people like this really do exist. When you find out that people like this really do exist, you'll want to kill them because that's what humans do. When you try to kill them, they will fight back, and it will not be good for anybody. And so seeing that I, seeing that I think this is going to come to a head soon enough anyway, this is your window to look into the life of a person like this so you have some basis of understanding what a person like this either can do, would do, or how they think or how they feel. And, and in my case, I say, you should know what they're like before you meet one. I'd like to know more about your personal experiences and how they illuminate this. Because certainly, this world of vampires, as you depict them, it's not a lot of fun. They're always having to look for more blood. But then again, you know, humans have to look for food. Otherwise, no food, you don't survive. So maybe, I know Randall asked about it before, maybe we can flesh this out further. 
in our remaining segments? Certainly. So do you have experiences, bloody or otherwise, dating back to your childhood that influenced you? Well, other than all the blood that I saw in my dreams and like that. I'm not talking about blo- I'm not talking about bloody dreams. I mean bloody reality. Or do you just have bloody dreams? Mostly in my mind. Okay. So, so this, what <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. What makes you think everyone would want to attack and kill these people because right now uh you can say you can google real life vampires and you can find out that there are these uh, subcultures and so on. And, and really, you know, most people just go, Ooh, you know, I mean, that's kind of weird party, but I don't think I don't, I just don't think I want to go, <laughs> but they don't, they don't get, you know, their pitchforks and torches out and, and go after them. Well, hopefully the human race would be a little more, um, discreet. I hope so. Have you, have you thought here, having dreamed about the possibility of vampires, they exist in a subculture, to take a trip, you get a few weeks off from work, and you go out there on the road, see what you can learn, go into small towns, have dinner and diners where people talk, and see what you could learn. Ever think that maybe something there would attract your feelings about the existence of people like this? Uh, I'm not certain that that would be, uh, you know, if the Holy Ghost helps, says do it, I do it. I certainly like to travel and be in different places. Uh, the storyline itself takes place in a number of different towns and cities. And one of these days, I'd really like to get out to actually see these places. Because I think that would be really neat. Let me pass by here. The cities in which these novels are set. Have you ever visited any of them, or did you just do online research or something to say, well, this is Piedmont, Alabama, and this is how it is? Uh, The story began in uh, Trenton, New Jersey. I have not been to Trenton. Uh, I have been to Odessa, Texas. I have been to Helena, Montana. Now, of course, I'm familiar with Chicago since I'm from there, although I haven't been up there in years. Uh, it, you know, the other places I haven't been to yet, but that's, you know, certainly something I might try at some point. Of course, it also may be a lot of fun to do all that kind of research in writing a book, if you can afford it, if there's a big, well, advance. But if you do it yourself... I recognize it's not always easy to get to the places you want. You know what? Let's talk more about this in our next segment with Gene, Douglas, and Randall. You're in the Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well-received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. How well and how fast does heart and body extract work to improve blood circulation? 
Listen. My name is Ellis, and I'm 66 years old, and I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Two years ago, I was diagnosed as having clogged arteries. I had 70% blockage in one artery leading to my heart. They wanted me to go on Plavix, but I refused, knowing the negative side effects. Heart and Body Extract is a unique balance, synergy, and proportion of herbs reaching from head to toe at maximum absorption around 95% at the cellular level. Within the first month, I felt a dramatic difference. The heaviness in my legs was reduced, and within two months, I felt completely normal. Your natural organic herbal formula for heart health is Heart and Body Extract. Heart and Body Extract comes with a 100% ironclad money-back guarantee. Details at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. Call 866-295-5305. 866-295-5305 for Heart and Body Extract. Healthcare reform is confusing, but whether it's finding an affordable insurance plan, keeping your doctor, or being able to afford needed prescriptions, navigating the healthcare system has become a challenge. Control your own healthcare costs and choices with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of each other's medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. It's been said, any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. $99 for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. This is Fred. Uh, hi, I'm Fred. Fred's a repeater. I tend to repeat. Fred has a business. I do have a business. And a problem. Fred repeats the same tired advertising over and over, and now it doesn't work. Over and over. But Fred is about to see a vision. I'm seeing a vision. Advertising on the Genesis Communications Network is the smart way for Fred to reach his potential customers with the most affordable national advertising rates, period. Get started today with GCN, the Genesis Communications Network. Just email advertise at GCNlive.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Okay, you have a number of locales for these stories, and maybe it's not possible to visit everyone, though it'd be a heck of a lot of fun. So, Douglas... How do you do your research about local culture and everything? Do you just go online, read books, whatever? I read a lot. I use Wikipedia a lot. I use Google Earth, especially Street View, uh, if I want to see what a city is like on the streets. Uh, When I first wrote uh, the first story, I didn't have those tools. All right. That, That definitely works out. That's a nice way to visit something. Maybe even watching a program, a travelogue, so you can get your image of the culture. Now, I'll give you an example of how things can work out now with smartphones and online chatting. My son Grayson has a WhatsApp account. He called us this morning, and he turned on his camera. And so there he is taking us on a tour of Madrid. And he turned his camera around so we could see the stores he visited, the local culture, get a kind of an idea of how things were, not what you read in a book, but just at street level, experiencing what he, in general, experienced in the course of his travels and talking to us. I suppose that's a way to help. Now, you have three books out there right now, right? Just the first two. Oh, the first two. And the third one is about what? Uh, The third one is With Deadly Intent. The fourth one is Overkill. 
And the, the next one would be Macon's story, which is the first historical one. Those are the ones that I'm working on now. Okay, so looking at these books now, the third volume in the series will be out when? Uh, I haven't finished it yet, so I have no date uh, when it could be finished. Okay. Now, I was just looking here that one of the places where um, vampires have been sighted and actually met is New Orleans. So that might be some place to check out here. This uh, one article I just happened to be happened to run across here said that uh, the author who wrote the piece said he's met 39 of them uh, in New Orleans. Yes, uh, New Orleans seems to attract them. Um... A few summers ago, I was in New Orleans. It was a wonderful trip. Did you get to explore around uh, where the you know these the shadow is where they might be hanging out, or how long were you there? There were some there were some specific things I wanted to see when I was there, and I did see them. Um, but it was a rather quick trip. I didn't have time for a um, more lengthy visit. Not that time. But maybe I'll go back and soon sometime, but I don't know when. Have you heard of psychic vampires? Yes. Can you, uh, what do you think of those? Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, my understanding of what people call a psychic vampire is a person with a physical manifestation of a religious spirit. Because that's what religion does. It sucks the life out of everything living to keep itself alive. That's what religion does. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Even even good religion. So, say, well, Christianity. Religion is, religion is religion. Relationship with God is relationship with God. There's a difference. Oh, okay. How do you see the difference between uh, religion and belief in God? Well, religion is all this practice that man makes up to get himself to God. And relationship with God, however you define that, is your personal experience and your walk and your your thought life and, you know, the choices you make. And all of that it comes from your relationship with him. I see. So for you, you are um, a follower of Christianity, but that doesn't necessarily mean you are affiliated with any particular church. I tend to be more comfortable in either an independent church or a Pentecostal church, uh, even though right now I'm attending a Baptist church. Have you ever experienced any other religious phenomena? Or... Well, yes, I, I have been to Russian Orthodox, greatly enjoyed it. I have been to, um, let's see, a variety of other churches around. But like I say, I, I tend to be more... Uh, comfortable with what people call Pentecostal. Okay. So you've never gone to a synagogue? Oh, yes, I've been to Jewish services, too. Yes. But, obviously I have, but they didn't inspire you the way the Christian church did. Now, I've gone, just so our listeners know, I've attended Wiccan, pagan services, I've been to lots of synagogues. I've been to various and sundry Christian churches. So I've seen a lot of different ways of worshiping. Mm, certainly. Have you experienced any of the uh, apostolic churches, uh, you know, where they do the speaking in tongues thing and get right into a whole state of what they believe to be kind of a resonance with, uh, I guess, the great spirit or whatever it is there? Well, in, in, 2000, in 2000, I was led to go to a Bible college, which was uh, promoted by a, uh independent church. And yes, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Bible college. And yes, I can speak in tongues and all of that. Let me tell you a story here, folks. Now, I'm not attacking anybody's religion. I respect all religions as long as they, they have good thoughts at the heart of it. So... I was working at a radio station with my first wife, Geneva, in Piedmont, Alabama. This goes back to the late 60s. And so I come in on a Sunday. Normally I didn't, but the person who worked on Sunday wasn't available. 
And I was told that this place called this place called Chapman's Chapel. That's the name. If there's a Chaplain's Chapel now, you know, I don't even think there's a resemblance. They would be coming in to do their show. And they paid for that show. And before they could do that show, before they were allowed in to do their show, they had to pay me the money. No money, no show. So they pay me the money. I don't know what it was, $50 or something. And they sit down. And I'm sitting next to Geneva, and we're just hanging out, listening to this. And so they're in a large production studio next to the main studio where I worked. And they go into a presentation, and during the sermon, the reverend talks about sinners, then points his eyes towards us, rather meaningfully. And then he speaks louder and louder, and I'm turning the volume control lower and lower. So it doesn't blast on the air, turn it lower and lower, and finally heard something in a language I never heard before. And for in the next few seconds, they were speaking in tongues, the one and only time I heard this. Now understand, I was a naive kid from Brooklyn, New York. I was 21 years of age. I didn't know anything about speaking in tongues. So I turned my head, did a double take, and tried to figure out what was going on. Later, Geneva, who was born in Alabama, explained to me what this meant. we got more to come. Douglas, Gene, and Randall, you're in. The Pittercast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T dot com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. If you like alkaline water or know someone that does, you're going to love the Dillon Living Water Bottle. It creates alkaline water on the go while reducing plastic waste and saving you money. Made with surgical grade stainless steel, the Dillon Bottle increases the pH up to 9 to deliver both alkaline and antioxidant water anywhere you want it. Alkaline water is healthier, tastes better, and can even boost energy. The Dillon Bottle makes it easy and affordable to be healthy and achieve optimal hydration. Get your Dillon Bottle today at dyln.co. That's dyln.co. USA Radio News with Chris Barnes. America mourns the passing of a man who people of all political stripes are calling a hero. We've got to get through these times, but I have a fundamental belief in the United States of America, and I still believe under the right leadership, our best days are ahead of us. Republican Senator and former Vietnam War POW John McCain has died at 81. The Senate's top Democrat, Chuck Schumer, thinks of him this way. John McCain was one of the greatest men I have met. You don't meet too many great men. He was one of them. McCain's office announcing the senator passed away late yesterday, surrounded by family at his home near Sedona, Arizona. The family had said on Friday he'd stopped medical treatment for an aggressive form of brain cancer. And you're listening to USA Radio News. There's no question you need omega-3s. But which form should you take? Fish oil or krill oil? Scientists have debated this for years. Luckily, there's a new solution to satisfy everyone. It's called Krill Omega 50 Plus. It combines ultra-pure fish oil and joint soothing krill oil together in just one tiny pill. It's so powerful, it can promote the health of your heart and your arteries. And if that wasn't enough, it can also boost your joint comfort in just days. We're so sure Krill Omega Omega 50 Plus will work for you. We'll even send you a free bottle to put to the test. The debate is over. It's not fish oil or krill oil. It's both. And now it's free. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and claim your free bottle. Call now. 1-800-399-6392. 1-800-399-6392. That's 1-800-399-6392.
Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-261-9818 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-261-9818. Again, 800-261-9818. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So hearing someone speaking in tongues, you think they're possessed. And since you've done this, Douglas, would you explain this to someone who's a neophyte, who has heard this one time? Are you possessed? No. The way that I explain it is... When a person receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes into your heart. He literally lives in you, and the way that I experience him, he's he's there because he wants to be there. That's possession, uh, folks. Mm, no, it's cohabitation. It's him <laughs> living yeah. in your mind, dwelling in your mind. And in your spirit, uh, because man is a spirit. Right, but who is is in control? Who is in control during this period where you're sharing your consciousness with an outside force? Always the man, because the scripture says uh, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Meaning that the man or the woman in this case, whatever it is, always has the the say-so. So So you're allowing yourself to share your consciousness with an outside force. Now, is this something where you invite them in with prayer, or they just show up? Now, to call the Holy Ghost an outside force seems a little bit not not quite right, because he is God, and as I've seen him, he's my best friend. Right, but he's not you, right? So I think all Gene means is there's you, and you have your own personality and your own life as a singular entity and then we have uh what you believe to be these other entities out there uh which go by the name of christ or or god it depends on sort of which version you want to go with on that so when one of those comes into your uh frame of reference consciousness or whatever it happens to be What you have is like you call it cohabitation, right? So it's cohabitation possession. I I think it just there's just a little bit of a a twist on the context. You know, one is negative, whereas one is sort of tolerable. In 2010, it was discovered that I had a demonic spirit in my head. Now you've probably seen the movies and so forth as to how to cast one of these out, but a friend of mine who understands his spiritual authority uh, simply uh, cast it out, and it wasn't the big deal that you may have seen in the movies because that's not how it works. Okay, you didn't levitate. Your head wasn't spinning no. around and around. No. Okay, that's but certainly refreshing. Yes. Gone, uh, I knew when it was gone because my thoughts cleared up tremendously. And the other people around me that saw me over the next few weeks said that I seemed, quote, lighter, or I guess you would say not as dark, uh, Uh per chance. Okay, so you said you had the demon within you. Was this at a time that you were doing a lot of your writing about vampires? Is it something that lasted for years or something that just happened? Well, I believe... When I had start ha- started having the bad dreams, 
when I was seven or eight years old. I think that was the demonic spirit back in that day manifesting. Uh, the point that I make, though, at this time, I had been at a Pentecostal church for about 11 years. So whatever demonic spirit was in me, it must have been a real teeny one because nobody noticed. It took them 11 years to even notice it. How do you know it was even there then? Uh, I mean, wouldn't I, you notice it? It, it started manifesting uh, on, like on a Wednesday night one night. and. Uh, my friend noticed it and we had a talk. Now, as part of him casting it out, I did have to make a declaration that I did not want it in my life. I did not want it. So I had, I had to speak the words to say, I, you know, in fact, I don't really not clear what all I said, but I said, I didn't want it in my life. And I made how did he notice it? And if you can, if you don't mind me, how, how, when you say he noticed it, you know, what was it that he noticed? When I was talking, I was I had asked permission at this point to go on a trip to South Carolina to see a certain graveyard. And sadly enough, along the storyline, it you know, the storyline is the demonic spirit would have driven. It was not the storyline I wanted to write. And so it was pulling me and manifesting about that time when I was talking to him about going on a trip to research the story. How is That's it what I was thinking. How is it manifesting to him uh, so that could he could see, see it? it. How, well, he could well, just see it. What did it look like? It, I don't know. Well, how do you know it uh, existed? Like I say, a, uh, like like I he, say, a spiritually sensitive person can pick up on things. And he was aware that it was in me, and I was aware that it was there by that time, uh, because my my speech and my thoughts were not what I would normally say and think. And so uh, it it was a very uh, uncomfortable feeling, really. Now, just to point but out here, once- there are psychological conditions, such as multiple personality disorder, that might result in this kind of behavior, acting like another person. Did you ever seek psychiatric help, or was it entirely through the church? It was entirely through the church. But once he cast it out, my, uh, well, I was in disrepute at that point anyway because of my stories that I wanted to write. They just didn't like it at all. Okay, once the devil was cast out, did you find any change? with your creativity, your ability to write these novels? Well, I saw them again in much more vivid uh, uh, detail. And when I was writing Rites of Passage, the second story, it it just flowed. So you're saying it gave you a sense of clarity? Well, the clarity, surely, but... When I was thinking about this storyline back in the day, uh, I was envisioning rites of passage as a story the first time when I had the demonic spirit in my head as a story that would chill the blood on a hot summer day. And that thought kept running through my mind as I was trying to think about writing it. And I think that's one of the reasons back way back when, when it stalled, and wouldn't go forward another step. But when I had the demonic spirit cast out and my thoughts were clear again, I saw the story like I, I think I originally intended it. And it's certainly not the kind of uh, a story that makes someone afraid, because as, as you meet Janine and see her and see Thomas going through the change, it's a much different kind of story than... If the demonic spirit had been in the driver's seat, it would have been just just another horror story. How much of yourself is in these stories? Like, is there? Uh, do you do you see yourself as um, sort of a, one of the characters in a in a way? So, do you speak through a particular character in the stories yourself? Well, so far as the characters are concerned, I think I'm all of them and none of them. You know, maybe a little piece of me is 
certainly in my consciousness and how they think has to come through my mind as I express it and write it. But uh, I am none of the characters. Okay. This is entirely something that you invented, these characters. We'll go into more of this and get our insights into this very, very interesting or fascinating process of creating a series of novels and envisioning an entire subculture that is vampiric. Douglas, Randall, and Jean, you're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. As you know, neighbors, web hosting can be pretty cheap, but not all hosting is the same. DreamHost wins best of awards year after year. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and even the low-cost plans put your sites on high-performance SSDs. Want to know more about what DreamHost has to offer? Go to technightowl.com slash host. Once again, that's technightowl.com slash host. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T.com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow, a new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. Hi, I'm Kelly Cook, Chief Marketing Officer for Kmart and Sears. Every baby deserves the best possible start, but not all babies get one. March of Dimes is changing that. You can help us lead the fight for the health of all moms and babies. Join me and Kmart to March for Babies. Let's raise funds and be champions for families near and far. Together, we are building a brighter future. Sign up for Kmart's team today at marchforbabies.org. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper, article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Are you afraid to go to the mailbox because of letter after letter from the IRS? Are they stacking on more and more penalties and interest? By now, you know the problem won't go away on its own. Don't let the IRS chase you to your grave with penalties and interest and liens and levies. You need real help now. I'm Dan Pilla. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I helped thousands of people solve tax problems they thought couldn't be solved. I can help you too. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com, danpilla.com.
Hi, this is Joshua P. Warren, author of The Poor Man's Paranormal, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We continue with our final segment of this journey through a dark, dark world. Douglas Robinson telling us about writing these silently books, working on the first two novels and later in the series. Have you had any interest or sought interest, Douglas, in having it on television? This seems to be something that ought to be ripe for a TV series, don't you think? I think it would play better as a movie. How so? The storyline is very specific, and the way that I've sort of mapped it out in my head, you take the contents of Silently and Rights, and that would be the first movie. You take the contents of With Deadly Intent and Overkill, and that would be the second movie. Yeah, but I think you have to realize, too, that when you do a movie, you really have to cut out a lot of the exposition because you're talking about something that's two and two and a half hours. and Packing two novels, full novels, into a single movie is exceedingly difficult. Of course, they did that with Harry Potter. But you also would find, you know, where they had basically, was it one novel per movie or something like that? You might find yourself taking one novel and making it into two parts if it's a big novel. Because I did this when my son Grayson and I took our first Rockoids book. And we took a couple of lessons in screenwriting, and we didn't pretend it was a really good screenplay. But we then took what we saw in this book and turned it into a screenplay, and what we did was concentrate more on the visual, where things that we write in 20 pages suddenly can be shown in the screenplay in a couple of scenes, even maintaining fidelity to the original book. So combining two books into a single movie seems a little unrealistic, don't you think? Well, the reason that I thought of them that way is because each of the two-story blocks seem to wrap around each other. For instance, Thomas is exposed to Bacon's blood in the first story, and he's going through the change in the second one, reliving what happened to him in the first one. So they sort of wind around each other. And so I've noticed that in the storyline, it just seems that each two stories together, so back to back, seem to wrap around each other, in a sense. Exactly, but you have to consider screen time and what you can present on the screen and what works better visually as opposed to with the written word. And I'm not an expert on screenplays, folks. I don't pretend to be. I don't play a screenwriter on TV or radio, but I know a little bit about it. Uh, I'm just wondering That's how that would happen. Point. Have you thought, though, about physically trying to write a treatment for the motion picture industry? A treatment uh, kind of showing us the plot of your book and how it might work out as a film. What I have is the storyline itself written in synopsis form. You know, I suppose any filmmaker would have the right to sort of pick through that. I mean, a synopsis can be a treatment. Okay, just to let you know. Right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with a treatment to be able to write one as of yet. So I sort of confess that I don't know enough. That's all right. That's all right. Like I said, I don't pretend to know much about it. Have you ever explored any of that, Randall? Not really, no. I've, I'm, I made a, I've taken a stab at writing some of it just for my own self, just to see what it would be like. So doing some script writing but I haven't actually submitted it to anybody. But, you know, actually, Gene, I think you make kind of a good point in terms of dividing it up into uh, more of a series because going back to the beginning there with Barnabas Collins, he's a fictional character in the ABC daytime serial, Dark Shadows, right? And that aired from 1966 to 1971. So you might be able to take that approach. And then if it were to build interest from that it's not uncommon for something like that to be then made into more of a feature film so you could break down uh your your books instead of combining two books into a single large movie you could actually break down individual books into a number of 
episodes. So, and something to consider there, it wouldn't be as much work. You could do it as, you know, a chapter at a time. I think you could maybe get a good shot at it. Let me think about that. What you're saying is like, make it like series fiction, where you tune in this week to see the episode because the hero was left in a situ- cliffhanger last week, and you got to come back this week to see if he survived. What would be really interesting about that, too, is because you've got this long story arc over several books that could actually last you out a number of seasons. And uh, people do very well with some of them. So if you were if you managed to get that done, I mean, uh, it would be an easy way to go and it could get you started and motivated to get the rest of the series done as well. You've got a really good start. You've got you could have a number of shows ready to go. You can shop that around to people in the networks. Maybe Netflix would pick it up if you were lucky. Why not? I mean, it can't hurt. That's an interesting approach, and I had not considered it. So thank you for letting me know. Yeah, you're working with a publicist now. Uh, You were saying, was it Nicole? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, talk to her about it. Uh, Sounds like it could be something that she could help you with. Well, I will certainly ask. And indeed, I don't know what kind of fees and services you ordered, but she might be the ideal person with whom to discuss further promotion, depending on what kind of budget you can put together, how best to submit your work to the motion picture industry. And maybe, of course, you would need an agent who's a signatory to the Writers Guild. I learned this, by the way, that the agent who represented us on our novels, she's retired now. She was a member of the Writers Guild, and we went through all the normal channels and did it the normal way. Because when it comes to submitting this to a producer or an actor or something, you have to have it that's already posted and listed at the Writers Guild, because they're not going to take anything that isn't kosher, for example, because, you know, there could be issues of copyright and disputes, which there are anyway. Hollywood's a pretty crazy place. But you need an agent who would do this. Do you have an agent? Uh, I do not. Okay. Maybe if something like that, if you want to navigate this into the big business, the world of motion pictures and everything, or TV, you'd probably want to try to seek out an agent, take your novels, the printed versions, submit them to agents, there are directories, and see, you know, what kind of response you get. In any case, I wish you best of luck with your series. And certainly, if anyone's listening who really is a vampire, if they want to get in touch with you, Douglas, how do they do it? They'll find me when they want to. They can do that. Ooh. Yeah, they they can do that. I don't think we've ever heard that answer before. I mean, I've heard answers, you know, look for me in Facebook. Walter Bosley says, look for me on Facebook. Alan Greenfield says, look for me on Facebook. Douglas says, if they want me, they'll find me. They certainly can. They can do that. All right. When you read the second story, you'll understand more. I'll look forward to it. We've got, what an interesting day. You don't have to visualize us, maybe in your worst nightmare. But you can find us on Twitter if you look for the Paracast. There are two Paracast fan clubs on Facebook. We will never combine them. They may merge into one someday if there's a way to do it realistically. We have a second radio show for you to listen to called After the Powercast. After the Powercast can be a mixture of anything. You can never predict what we'll do. After the Powercast is only available if you subscribe to the Powercast Plus. We also give you something else that people on YouTube always talk about a version of the show free of the network ads, better quality audio. And you get this with a subscription to the Paracast Plus. And some of you, if you're a subscriber to the Paracast newsletter or a member of our forums, you'll be getting a special, special, special offer by about the time you listen to the show. For more information, go to plus.theparacast.com. That's plus.theparacast.com. Randall, where do we find your stuff? ufopages.com ufopages.com Douglas Robinson it's been a fun discussion about your world thank you for joining us on the Paracast thank you for having me the Paracast 
featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.